Whiskey Club members, I am so excited tonight. We are celebrating two things and two things that are maybe a first off, well, definitely a first off and maybe a last off as well. Number one, it is the Whiskey Club's 10th birthday. We could not be more excited with two whiskey tastings to celebrate. <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil, Happy birthday, to celebrate. <laughs> It is incredibly exciting, but the second is the people around me tonight. So, if you haven't already seen, we are joined by three absolute whiskey legends. And I will start with the Honourable, oh, on that side, the Honourable Dr. Rachel Barry of Ben Rea, Glendronic and Glenn Glasser. Dr. Rachel, how are you tonight? I'm very well, thank you. Good day, everyone. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> Absolute pleasure to have you. I will then go to the man just below us, uh, the man who is up at 2 a.m. Thank God and God bless him over in Poland. It's Mr. Miles Monroe of Westwood. How are you, my friend? Terrific. Yeah. Yeah. I always end up here with you guys at 2 a.m. I love it. Well, I mean, <laughs> whether you're in celebrate. Australia or in the States, we always seem to be having a dram at 2 a.m. and it's an absolute <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> And then there is a industry founder to my left as well that I just cannot wait to introduce uh, right on the screen. Uh, it is uh, Mr. Bill Lark of Lark Distillery as well. How are yes. you, mate? Good, pal. Good. Good to be here with you for your 10th anniversary. Yeah, 10th anniversary. It's a, it's a little bit unbelievable. And uh, as the members who are watching know, we reached out to them uh, when we were just winding up for the anniversary and we were getting ready to sell the uh, the incredible dream of releasing our last 10 years of whiskeys as a whiskey of the month. And we reached out and said, who would you love to see in a tasting all together? And perhaps not surprisingly, the three of you are mentioned. So it is an incredible opportunity to get a bit of a round table on you three and three incredibly different whiskey making backgrounds and philosophies. So without further ado, I would love to firstly throw to Rachel and for anyone who somehow is still not familiar with you and your whiskey making profile, could you tell us a little bit about what's brought you here today? Well, you have, Seamus. Well, <laughs> and the celebration, of, the celebration of the 10th anniversary, of course, you know, <laughs> to be with whiskey fans. That's where it all started. Started with for me, and I'm here there. To, I'm, a, I'm a fan, first and foremost, you know. When I was a teenager at university, I was collecting miniatures of whiskey. That's all I could afford, getting to know all the facilities I could get to know studying chemistry and just happened to serendipitously fall across a job I never even knew existed at Scotch Whiskey Research Institute. Research scientist with the late, great Dr. Jim Swan. Um, worked with him for many, many years. Um, and then into the industry and my God, yes, everything you can imagine. So it would, <laughs> it would take far too long for me to explain it all. But I've tasted about 165,000 casks. That probably sums it up. Um, tra traveled the world and um, made a lot of us <laughs> well, two years. Bill, you've tasted 165,000 of other people's casts, so <laughs> that gets you. Uh, uh, that's a big number, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> you me. Uh, and of course, I mean, that's the start, but the most recent chapter in uh, in your story is, of course, managing the wonderful distilleries like the Glen Glasser, Benrick, mm. and Glendronic. I mean, this is the portfolio that other whiskey makers get to dream of. Uh, it must be an incredible time. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, it's a dream, you know, to have the, the diversity of style. You know, if you think about it, my goodness, we go from the mountains with Ben, which means hill, the mountains, Ben Riach, to the Glen, deep down in the valley, in the Valley of Forg with Glendronic, and then right to the sea with Glen Glasser, where our distillery is literally pretty much on the beach. Any closer than it would be in the sea. So wherever you go in the world, where are you going to be most influenced geographically? You're by a mountains, you're by a valley, or you're by the sea in any landscape. So, yes, I'm very, very fortunate. And they're only like 20 to 30 miles apart, but you couldn't get any more different in style. Um, and, um, you know, just their balance of flavor. So, you know, it is, it's like my three sons. They're all completely different. <laughs> and I do know which one is which. 
Um, and they need to be nurtured in different ways, brought to life in different ways, and of course celebrated with the whiskey club in different ways. So I hope is that a glass of Glen Glasser you've got in your hand? You're raising a uh, glass of Glen Glasser. I'll be honest with you, <laughs> Bill and I were quietly just finishing off an old glass oh. of the release that we worked on, but just a sneaky start up. The, the next glass will be a glass of glass, glass. So I don't know. Oh, great. I'm sure you've got another glass there and you've got the bottle there, I can see. So, um, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that was just such a beautiful one. You know, Glen Glass is so distinctively sweet, you know, but made shaped by the sea, but it has this luscious tropical salinity that is like no other distillery on this planet. It's just amazing. And I've tasted a lot of other whiskeys too. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I've, I always ask people, all the whiskey clubs, all the fans say, tell me another distillery that tastes like Glen Glass and nobody can get close. There's no, not, another, no other distillery. So no. we're very lucky to have our distillery um, on the beach in the North Sea in Zandin Bay because it makes something very, very unique. I, uh, I I can't hide my love for your uh, your distillery there, all of your distilleries. But yeah, if I'm picking favourite children, I wouldn't struggle. Um, and I, I can't hide my love for your whiskey making with it. But if we're talking about diverse geography and how it influences, well, Mr. Miles Monroe, I mean, Westwood, it, it's it's not on a hill and it's not in a valley. It's uh, It's almost a city based distillery, isn't it? Um, it is, yeah. I mean, we the distillery is in Portland, in Oregon, in the in the northwest part of the country. But we are actually we are in the bottom of the Willamette Valley. We're we're surrounded by mountains. We've got the coastal range to our west and the Cascade Range to our east. So yeah, we're kind of nestled here. Uh, yeah, at the Willamette River, pretty much at the bottom of the valley. Um, and you know, we've yeah, we've got a pretty unique climate here as well. I love this. I mean, aside from just the different approaches and styles of the three of us here. Um, just the, the places in the world. I mean, they're, they're just all the corners, right? We are, uh, yeah, we're in a place that's, you know, pretty temperate, but it's rainy in the winter. And right now in the summer, it's very hot, it's very dry. Um, so we've got, uh, yeah, we've got a pretty unique climate here as well, as far as, you know, aging whiskey goes. But, but yeah, I mean, we are, we are definitely, you know, based in Portland. Uh, that's, that's our whole kind of approach really is, that maker culture that is Portland, so whether it's our food or our spirits, our beer, our wine coming out of the Willamette Valley. It's all very collaborative and everyone is just really kind of pushing each other uh, forward to just, you know, express more delicious flavor. So, yeah, I mean, Portland certainly is, um, you know, a lot. Uh, it, it's attached to who we are and what we're doing. Right. It's, um, a, you know, to use the over the overused phrase in whiskey sense of place. Right. But uh, it really is. Yeah, a lot of who we are and why we do what we do, for sure. Well, I think then, uh, before we continue on to lag, it's worth dwelling on that while it looks incredibly different from, say, what Rachel's working on, where it's traditionally of its geography and its landscape, Westwood still does feel very of its place. And I think there's no better summary of that than your approach to brewing and distillation. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit, but it is really born of not only the geography of where you are, but also the people of where you are. Yeah, which, I mean, if you really look at the definition of terroir, it's it's, it's everything. It's a culture included, right? It's the people making it as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're all ex-brewers here. We have a rich brewing heritage in Portland. So absolutely, we apply that to how we're making the whiskey, the flavors that we get out of it. Uh, yeah, 100%. I mean, that's just, um, look, I mean, you know, we're in the U.S., right? We're known for making bourbon and rye. You know, single malt's just not something that the U.S. is typically known for. But where we're located is where the best barley in, in North America is grown. So, yeah, I mean, why not? Incredible. And then, Bill, I mean, this is an incredible question to get to ask you because even though the, the people around this table, uh, they, they have so much experience with Taiwan, wow, you're the only one of us all who have looked at the geography around you and said, you know what, we need a distillery here. <laughs> I mean, that must be so incredible for the last story. Yeah, and, and I mean, it is a story of chance, but it's also um, born of my love of enjoying Scottish single malts. And, Rachel, I can tell you, my biggest fear when when, <laughs> when, I, when I decided I wanted to see if we could make whiskey in Tasmania because it was a day when I'd probably had 
a bit too much to drink with my father-in-law on a fishing trip and we were sort of just discussing how our climate is you know should be okay everybody knows our water's spectacular and the environment and um, I knew we must be growing good barley because our beers cascade and bogues were now being exported around the world and I just said to Max I wonder why somebody isn't making whiskey in Tasmania but my biggest fear was I want to see if we can make whiskey here and I want it to be a Tasmanian whiskey. I don't necessarily want to copy what Scotland does because they do it so well and I love it and respect it so much. My biggest fear was what are they going to think about some stupid colonial twit trying to make whiskey? <laughs> and and that did really worry me. And uh, anyway, that I soon overcame that when we finally got legislation changed and we got our licence and... Out of the blue, two weeks after getting my licence, I had a phone call late at night, picked up the phone. It was John Grant from Glen Farkas Distillery. He says, hello, Bill. Um, I've heard you've got a licence to make whiskey. Would you let me help you make good whiskey? And I just thought, wow, how amazing. <laughs> that started our journey. It's it's an incredible journey you've gone on. And it's something I want to take to you, Miles, um, because I've heard you speak a lot about your philosophy making whiskey and, again, trying to look at it from being different to scotch but inspired by scotch and also inspired by more traditional american whiskey i think a lot of what bill said resonates with your points definitely does yeah and i mean to his to, to many points that he just made but yes i mean a love and a reverence for single malts you know coming from scotland um you know irish whiskey as well but again yeah what what would be the point of trying to replicate that here mm -hmm. right um, yeah, we want to, we want to, you know, put our own stamp on it. And I mean, you see, you know, single malt's made all around the world now, right? Uh, just, just all over. And I, I think you get so many wonderful expressions of, of whiskey that way. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, in our, in our, actually, it's great that, um, you guys, you're turning 10 right now. We're actually turning 20, uh, at the moment as well. And, you know, 20 years ago, we were one of the few making single malt here, in the US. And so, yeah, you have that thought of, well, what, what makes this different? Why, why is it different? What is our approach here? And so, um, yes, we're, we're also, you know, coming from the United States. So we are an American whiskey. So what does that mean? Right? What can we do that uh, um, still has people understanding that it's American whiskey and it's not really alienating in any way. So, you know, that's why we're putting our new make into charred new oak cast, right? So, in that way, it is a hybrid of these styles, right? You're you're getting that new oak character, that baking spice, coconut, vanilla, um, you know, pr more pronounced color, more pronounced aromatics from the cask. Um, something that's yeah, really a hallmark of American whiskey. But you know, attaching that to uh, to single malt, and I think just sort of um, defying expectations in a good way. Yeah. Oh, it's it's unbelievable, and it's it's very fun to get to ask this next question because. Miles, as you've just said, you're just turning 20. Bill, Lark Distillery just turned 30. Rachel, the next big birthday for Glenn Dronick <laughs> is 200. <laughs> it is. I was just about to say that. I'm glad you beat me to it. But, yeah, 200 <laughs> years in uh, 17 months and a few days' time, I think. It's uh, just around the corner, so that's going to be an exciting year. And, you know, it's um, stood the test of time. And... You know, it's a distillery, as you know, it looks like, a, you know, it looks more like a castle. It's been around since, you know, Victorian years, you know, 1826. Um, and, you know, it's a distillery which continues to raise expectations. And that's mm. what I love about Glendronic in particular is, you know, coming from that valley deep down in the Valley of Ford, you can't even see the distillery from the road. It's so hidden away, as far away as you can get from a city. Um, very, very, very rural. I think there's more sheep than people. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we have a whiskey now that's obviously revered all around the world, you know, going back in our warehouses till um, the 1960s. So our whiskies might not be back till 1826, but, you know, we've got whiskies that are, you know, verging on oh, more than 50. I mean, they're, they're nearly 60 years old. So, you know, that is really quite incredible. And they're still going strong. You know, they're still there. They're still, 
you know, there's definitely something about whiskey lives longer in the Valley of Fork. <laughs> it really does. Um, and, um, you know, it stood the test of time. So that's going to be a fun year. Um, you know, new visitor centre, you know, it's out in the press, a lot of investment there and also investment in expanding the distillery um, as well because the demand is so great. So this is a... It, you know, in two years' time, it's 17 months' time is going to be a very exciting year. But actually, in the next week, it's going to be quite exciting too. So, what <laughs> it's um, it's an incredible time, I think, to be looking at Scotch. And you could you could almost you could start measuring the age of your casks in number of Lark distilleries that uh, the whiskey's been around for. There's 60 year old cast. That's two Lark distilleries that it's existed for, or three Westwoods, uh, which is pretty incredible. Is but amazing. you um, you have this wonderful opportunity, I guess, and you use it so well of having Glentronic, which sits as this more traditional, old school, sherry driven style. But you also get Ben Rick with the Warehouse 13 and that wonderful mm -hmm. experimentation side. and. Glen Glasser being that wonderful kind of third child distillery. Is it is it uh, encapsulating your whiskey making philosophy and getting to Absolutely. do the old and the new? Absolutely. I mean, I've got three sons, you know. One was two, was two, two was too few and four is too many. <laughs> so three was is just perfect and they're all so different and they all get nurtured in such different ways of different strengths. Yeah. And, you know, my philosophy is obviously to bring out the best, the most distinctive, aspects of that character that is so unique and that raises expectations every time um so yeah i mean diversity is king for me um but what i love is that with three distilleries you absolutely get the diversity and the breadth it's never boring there's never a dull moment um there's always lots of opportunities to try new things to experiment especially with Ben Riek. um and you know i mean as i said from the diff three very different landscapes it's it's remarkable and then when i can really because it's only 3 rather than 23 say i can really get into the depths and the dna of every distillery you know in incredible depth so with Ben Riek, you know, we've got three styles, um, as I'm sure you're aware, with triple distilled, with um, our classic orchard fruit, delicious fruit forward spirit, and and then our um, peaty style in the smoke season, which we're just about to start up in, in the next month or so. Um, so, and then, you know, three, three styles, but it's closer to about 103 types of casks, I have to say. Um, it's almost getting there. So the fun I can have at the distillery is, is remarkable. And then Glen Glasser, well, it tells its story. It's so influenced by the sense of place that, you know, it just won't be changed, you know. Uh, previous owners tried to change it, tried to muck about with it, <laughs> to make it more like another distillery. And it wasn't for changing. It's like, so coastal it's like not not moving not changing for you folks um mm. such a distinctive distillery so yeah they've all got different personalities they've all got different strengths and um you know that's what makes it wonderful and makes it a very rich world to work in um the world of whiskey the world of single malt and even just our three distilleries not far apart you know um, and taking them to the world as well, of course, which is, is great fun. They do have those three incredibly distinct profiles. And I have to ask, and, and Miles, I'll ask you this question afterwards as well, but for you as a whiskey maker, Rachel, are you trying to encapsulate those kind of distillery characteristics every time you're making a whiskey? Or are you even finding that, oh, you've got this great idea for Ben Rick, but it actually turned out to be more of a Glen Glass idea after you tested it and tinkered with it? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> That's all I can say. Well, I've been doing this for 32 years, obviously working with other distilleries. So I did bring a little bit of knowledge from my previous roles, working with maturation, working with Dr. Jim Swan, of course, very closely. And um, I kind of knew what things would kind of work. But then even saying that, you know, I'm getting new casts in all the time that I've not experimented with. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, with Glendronic, it's so robust and, you know, full bodied and with that rich, dark fruit, you know, it just absolutely that robust Highland spirit, which is nothing like it. Come on. I mean, in the Eastern Highlands of Scotland, so many distilleries now in Scotland and there's nothing like Glendronic. It definitely is arguably the most robust, full bodied and the different sherry styles. I mean, we use the King of Sherry, Pedro Jimenez. Um, we also have Oloroso, which is another beautiful style. But, you know, I can I can play with different sherry styles. But first and foremost, I'm looking for our four facets of flavor, which are full bodied, dark fruit, robust Highland spirit and this elegant Spanish flair that comes through in the oak casks from Spain. So I'm very much in this territory which is a big territory, as you can imagine. You can dial up and dial down within these four main facets of flavour. And then with Ben Riach, um, Ben Riach with its rugged beauty off the still um, for the peaty style and then just beauty for its classic style. It's so orchard fruit forward and so delicious. It just glides on your tongue. And then it's a beautiful, I always describe um, Ben Riach like a kaleidoscope or like a carousel that just, you know, wants to experiment, wants to try new things, wants to explore flavor. But you know that whichever cask you're going to put it into, it's always going to have this beautiful gliding, silky carousel of flavor that just has so many dimensions and just, cascades on your palate it's so delicious so yeah there's there's so many things so you can imagine Ben Riet can go so many different ways with that flavor mm. profile and it's so much fun um and then Glen Glass even in a sherry cask you know the, the whiskey you've got in front of you um the 12 year old um px is like nothing like you've tried um mm. in a sherry cask before because it's so unctuous so syrupy, so luscious, and you know, the glass has never dry. It's like everything, every element of barley is 100% converted into this lush coastal elixir, and the sherry just brings up even more of that lush. You know, even an all or also sherry cask, which I think, oh, in some whiskies that can be a bit dry, it can be nutty, like walnut or chocolate walnuts or whatever. And, you know, with a Glendronic, you know, you definitely get that slightly more dry, robust character with the Oloroso. But with Glen Glasser, you just don't notice it. It's just like, no, I'm going to steamroll through this. I'm rolling away the flavor <laughs> all the way. And that Oloroso cast is just going to bring out more of that luscious sweetness and syrupy character. So, yeah. It's, um, it's incredible to summarize it like that. <laughs> It's even better when I've got Bill having his first drams of this going glass release going mm, mm, next to me. <laughs> luscious get it, Bill. Is the first thing that came to mind, Rachel, that, that really is luscious. Yeah, certain syrupy, you get the luscious syrupy, mm -hmm. a little bit tropical. But yeah, it's so different from other spirits and sherry casks. And this is the thing is when people talk about maturations, oh, sherry casks, you know, it just masks the spirit. I'm like, wow, if you try a Ben Rhea, <laughs> Uh, which is something obviously I do as well. Mature Ben Riach and the whole hotchpotch of different cherry casts, American, Oak, European, Spanish. Try a bit of everything with Ben Riach. Um, and then a Glen Glassa and then a Glendronic. You're like, wow. Even in yeah. the same glass, they are totally different whiskies. Oh, right. So, so I'm, I'm thrilled you've touched on uh, the impact of casks there because I think it leans really naturally onto uh, what Miles's whiskey making philosophy has certainly shone more to be. And that's, of course, more on the brewing side. I would love it if you could uh, share a little bit about how uh, your distillery is making whiskey in comparison to, say, more traditional Scotch Miles. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned before, you know, we've got a pretty rich brewing heritage here in Portland. Um, Christian, our founder, our director of operations, myself, I, most of my distillers were all ex-brewers, right? And and we we see the connection between beer and whiskey and that, you know, it's it's the same raw material, right? It's malted barley. And so where do you go from there? Um, for us, it's all about fermentation. You know, we know as, as brewers that there's over 600 flavor compounds you can produce just from, you know, a beer yeast strain alone, 
right? If you do it the right way, if you treat the fermentation the right way, and that's what we're doing. We're approaching it as, as a brewer would. Um, you know, these are closed fermentation tanks. They're uh, super sanitary fermentations. People here in the States have started using the term sweet mash. Um, and, you know, in that we're, we're doing about a, you know, seven day uh, cool ferment, really just trying to get as much, you know, wonderful like stone fruit, tropical fruit esters out of these fermentations. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first half of the process, Seamus, you've been to the distillery. It looks like a brewery, right? That's that's what we know. That's what we're doing. We're trying to produce these beautiful flavors. Um, so then by the time you get to the stills, right, we have these custom built pot stills. They're very low reflux. Um, it's really all about just concentrating that grain flavor, which, you know, is all, like I said, all grown here in the Northwest is concentrating that wonderful grain flavor, concentrating those beautiful fermentation characteristics that we've got um, from those, you know, carefully plotted out upfront processes. Um, and at that point, yeah, we're, we're just letting it speak for itself. Like I said, really just imbuing a sense of where this is coming from, you know, mm -hmm. um, really just uh, taste the grain, taste the fermentation, um, really, really get to, you know, what the beginning of whiskey really is all about, right? I mean, Westward is designed to be on the younger side. We want it rich and robust and bright, vivacious, just kind of jumping out of the glass. Um, and so that's that's what we're doing up front. Uh, as an ex-brewer, you, kn you know, I know that, you know, once you're done with your conditioning of the beer, that's it, right? It's 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 going out to to the public to have people drink it. And I think that's really what we're trying to capture with our single malt initially, right? Is is that wonderful beer aspect of it? Um, you know, when it gets to you know, duration to the cask, uh, we're looking for a balance. You know, we don't we don't want too too much of an oak influence on the spirit itself. Uh, really, just trying to highlight what's already there. And um, I, I think that's really what we're aiming for. I think that's kind of why we, you know, shy away from age statements. It's just, you know, this is whiskey that's ready when it's ready, when it's, when it's you know, it's, it's maturity over age when it comes to Westward, right? Um, that's what we're looking for, just this big, bright, vivacious spirit. Um, and, you know, when it comes to any kind of cask influence, um, I think, you know, something that we really have bonded with the Whiskey Club Australia over is how we do that. Uh, I think we found not only a bunch of fans, but honestly partners in what we do with you guys in how we do this um, with our approach to uh, cast finishes, secondary maturations, really only just trying to highlight what's already in the whiskey, really just turning the volume up on the elements that are already in there. Really, that's the, that's the whole point. Um, I do want to mention what I'm drinking. Uh, real quick, I've got, and I was gifted this a few years ago. This is the Hobart Whiskey Winter Feast 2019. <laughs> um, this is just blowing my socks off right now. I actually haven't sipped on it in a while. Um, I thought I'd pour myself a little given given the occasion, um, and it's fantastic. Yeah, that's that's an insane whiskey. Uh, for Rachel's reference, that is uh, matured in an ex maple syrup cask, I believe. Uh, it is big and chewy and made of things that wouldn't be allowed to be called scotch. But uh, my goodness, is it tasty? <laughs> no, it's delicious. It's the um, dark mofo. Yeah. With, yeah. 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 That just happened, didn't it? Just recently. Yeah, we just we just had our last dark mofo, and uh, well, our most recent dark mofo. I shouldn't say last. Um, and uh, and yeah, the the guys have. Again, I think the 2019 was it. Uh, that's a maple syrup stout cask, uh, is which it? is uh, pairing that uh, big chewy whiskey. But I may be wrong. I'm working from memory there. Um, but it's it's amazing that you uh, you spoke a little bit about brewing there because having had the opportunity to try the uh, the mash from all three of your uh, your namesake distilleries. Um, Westwoods is the only one that really is characteristic of a really fruity beer, while some of the others kind of go in a more robust direction or even a slightly kind of soured direction, which obviously distills into incredible spirit. Westwoods that only one that you could literally drink a pint of that and uh, and really enjoy it. Uh, and it's interesting you mentioned that seven day ferment because Bill at last yeah. you really pioneered that really long fermentation style. Yeah, I. I, I um... Listening to your story, Miles, is sort of kind of where we came to, but n n not because I'm a brewer. It, we came to it by accident and because I'm lazy. 
And um, when I started, <laughs> when, when I started brewing initially, it suited me to go out to our distillery and on Monday to um, put the wash into the still and turn the wash still on and also do a spirit run and um, get those running and then do my next brew for the next week. I was only doing sort of one barrel a week at the time. And um, it just suited me to leave it so that I could come in on the one day and do all of those things. And so we put it, the, the, the wash went into the washbacks at about, oh, the, the, about um, uh, late in the afternoon. And then first thing, so six and a half days really later, we put it in the still. And we did that, as I said, that's a matter of convenience. But what we discovered was those flavours you talked about, Miles, those fruity floral flavours that you get with that longer fermentation period. Um, and so that's a style that uh, it worked for us right back then and uh, we continue to do that today. It's uh, been, been very important to us. And, um, you know, when I started, as I said, we we were worried about what the Scottish people might think about what we're doing. And with the help of John Grant, what I, Lynn and I wanted to do right back in the beginning was to produce a whisky that was balanced, um, that was elegant, that allowed me to put it in front of somebody and explain to them all of the elements that go into making a Tasmanian single malt whisky. When I um, started, I didn't know much. Of, I didn't know anything about it. I, I had a bit of help from John, and then I went to Cascade Brewery, one of the last breweries in Australia, to do their own maltings, and I bought um, their malted barley, which was for brewing, and um, because it was convenient for me to go up to Cascade and buy their brewing barley, um, we started playing around with an ale yeast and decided that uh, we really enjoyed the character of the, the wash coming from that. We were able to very easily get a hold of some Australian, uh, we used to call them port casks, we call them tawny now, but we were using Australian tawny casks. And just in those early days in doing all of our experimentation and tasting, I very quickly developed a real fondness for whiskey matured like that, brewed like that, and with that seven day or six and a half day fermentation. I remember, in, I think it was about 2009 in the World Whiskey Awards, we won an award for, in those days, they called it the best other single malt whiskey. In other <laughs> words, it wasn't from Scotland, it wasn't from Ireland, it wasn't from Japan. Um, and I remember being at a dinner in Scotland not long after and uh, Ian Buxton um, was the head judge at the time and Ian came up and introduced himself to me and and he said, Bill, you thoroughly deserve to win that award. Um, now tell me, what are you buggers doing down there in Tasmania? How can you produce such a beautiful, big, rich and elegant whiskey like this? And we talked about it and um, we talked about the fact that we're using a brewing barley, um, the six and a half day fermentation. The fact that inspired by listening to John Grant's story about his father playing around with quarter casks, we decided right back at the very beginning that we were going to use quarter casks um, for us. And the combination of the smaller cask, um, the brewing barley, and, uh, you know, that's, Ian said that's kind of why you're doing so well. He said, but there's something else, Bill. Tell me about your climate. And uh, I said, oh, well, you know, it's bloody, you can wake up in the morning and it's 10 degrees and by lunchtime it's 30 degrees and, um you know, and we have the great seasonal variations. And he said, well, Bill, I think that's really working in your favour. You've got that greater um, range of temperatures that's allowing the whisky to move in and out of those small barrels beautifully through the charcoal layer. Um, all of those things we did, not because I'm a brewer, Miles, but because um, we, we just, we sort of had to, we fell into it. But luckily yeah. for us, it produced the whiskey that is now Lark Whiskey. Mm -hmm. Which is an absolutely incredible whiskey. I love that. I mean, and and some of it, you right, you know, yeah, convenience or a happy accident, but a lot of it, you know, turning to your own environment, your own culture, uh, and what you had at hand to make make your whiskey, right? And I think that's that's truly what what can make a spirit great is is accessing what you have at hand, right, as much as yeah. you can. Um, just turn, turning to your own environment and using what's there is is I think really where the magic comes from. That's incredible. Yeah. There's something really special as well that I, I don't think um, you've dwelled on there, but is the access to those casks. The casks that you were using back in those days, those old port casks, 
they weren't just seasoned with port. And Miles, obviously, we experimented with this with the uh, recent Australian musket cask release that we uh, worked on. I mean, the Australian fortified wine industry is one of the longest lineages of fortified wine going around. We're so lucky that we now have a, one of our directors, the owner of Seppelsfield Winery in the Barossa Valley. In 1878, Joseph Seppel started laying down Australian par a port, and he said to his family, Some, a greater proportion of our production each year is not allowed to be touched for at least 100 years. So Seppelsfield today... Wow. has the longest lineage of port casts, not even Portugal or Spain has, because they were interrupted by wars and one thing and another. But they've got barrels to this day that go back to 1878 that have never had the port taken out of them. And we're now lucky enough when they do decant those casks, we get first access to them, which is just sensational. Incredible. Mm. It's um it's incredibly special and of course Miles we got to work on that with the recent uh, Australian musket cast release um with the wonderful guys in Rutherglen as well and I think that really showed off a, a wonderful synergy between uh, Westwood Distillery and uh, Australian alcohol. Yeah, that that was I mean what a what a ridiculous thing that actually became real, right? I think this <laughs> this started with um, yeah, you know, we've got our we've got our wine region here, the Willamette Valley AVA, and it's you know producing incredible Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays. But of course, I'm I'm pulling all kinds of casts that winemakers have because why not, right? These are truly wet fill barrels. They're emptied for a couple hours before my truck is there picking them up from the winery that's you know just down the road. So um, yeah, which led to right kind of filling into some muscats and then chatting with you and Johnny about what might be something fun to do. And then, yeah, realizing that, I mean, Rutherglen, like, yeah, obviously that's where it's at. Right. Um, yeah. So, okay. Let's start shipping casks, you know, all around the world to each other. Like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> An absolutely insane thing to do. And something I've been pestering Rachel about, about potentially. Yeah. Well, we do have, well. we, we have built <laughs> some Australian Shiraz casks. So. Ooh, um, very yeah, so experimenting away, experimenting away, and uh, obviously you can imagine that's um, Ben Riek is the, really the where I do most experimentation. So that's uh, what's gone into these casks. So I'm really that's excited awesome. to see. Um, yeah. I mean, Ben Riek can you know it can embrace so many different cast types. It just seems to be a spirit with such. Mm. Joie de vivre. I can't think of another way of putting it. It just kind of effortlessly kind of glides through the world of flavor and is always a cascade of flavor. It just, just is incredible, incredible spirit and so incredibly versatile for, um, for maturation. You know, you can really twist and turn it like a kaleidoscope going in different directions. So I'm really excited to see what these are going to be like. I think we'll sample them in the next few months. Next it plays months. well with others. It certainly <laughs> does. And it plays very well with others. It really, really does. Um, it, it just is such a, a beautiful, um, I think because it's so fruit forward, because it's, you know, they've got the beautiful orchard fruit, but then, you know, that is the finesse, that's the, you know, the delicacy, that's like bringing the patisserie into the world of whiskey. It's so luscious and, and fruity, but it's also got the, like the finest, almost like a filo pastry type of maltiness, which is very, very creamy and is the perfect base to then build the richness of flavor you know to be enriched by ben Riek and through different cast types and flavor exploration so you know for me ben Riek is just like it, it's like every time i try a different cast type it's like going on holiday to a favorite to an incredible location <laughs> and like going to sicily and bringing back Mar marsala cast and when you actually yeah. try the whiskey it's like oh my goodness you have played well together. Haven't you had a good time? <laughs> <laughs> and it really just brings that, that character of Sicily to Ben yeah. Riek. And that's what I love about Ben Riek is it, it just plays so well um, with its fruit, malt, and oak, added layers of smoke. And, you know, that kaleidoscope, that cascade of flavor that just, it just has a, an incredible ease to it you know it's just joie de vivre it just 
glides through life with the greatest of ease, um, exploring all these different um, cast types. And um, I don't think I've found any Ben Reik, actually, that doesn't work from different uh, different cast types. So, um, you know, that's the, the challenge. I can say that for other distilleries I've worked with, but Ben Reik just seems to embrace the change. That's fantastic. And uh, please don't stop trying because no. the experimentation has been oh. very enjoyable to uh, drink yeah. on this side. It's all about the endeavour, Seamus. It's all about the endeavour, you know. <laughs> it's, it's that type of whiskey. You've just got to keep on exploring, you know. You never stop doing it. Never, you know, it just wants to keep climbing that bend, you know, climbing the hill. And it never quite gets to the top or it gets to the top and there's another hill to climb. There's always... Right. So much fantastic. Doing, you know fantastic right Rachel, I'll ask you one last question and then I'll get into the uh the amazing questions that members have been sending us throughout the entire evening and um uh, Rachel, for you that's where you're working with such diverse spirit styles and Ben Rick, which is working well with every kind of cask, is there something is there one through line that you're looking for? in a cask that means it's going to be high in quality, that it's going to deliver a good whiskey to you? Uh, such, a, such a difficult one to answer. I mean, it's it has to be richness of character. You know, it has to come down to complexity, richness, um, and an ingenious fusion of flavour, really. Uh, for me, it's, it's why it's worth experimenting, doing different things, um and sometimes expecting you know the unexpected mm. so for me maturation is you know when you're trying new things it is 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 just completely wanting to be surprised waiting for that eureka moment that surprise and i think that's what really drives the industry forwards this experimentation the exploration of flavor and, and at the end of the day, you know, we we do release single casts as well, of course, um, and expressions for the Whiskey Club that are still small in volume. So you, you enable those nuances to come through, those riches, those unique characters to come through and those um, different dimensions. So I think never boring, always rich in character and um, also bringing out the best in the distillery character as well. So it's, a, you know, the best it can be. And it always exceeds expectations on taste, which is a very difficult thing to quantify. And I, yeah. you know, it, it's, but if you're, if you're a judge in a whiskey competition, you'll know exactly what I mean. <laughs> you know, when you nose it, it opens, you know, it awakens your senses, but when you taste it, it's, it's that, wow, this is much more interesting it you know is like a cascade of flavor or whatever in your palate it does things you, you just don't expect it's fun etc etc so for me that is the most important thing is that richness and and obviously nothing to nothing dry or too, um, or bitter <laughs> don't want any of that um or um yeah it it, it has to add complexity Mm. and develop the fruit and develop the flavor you know in a very um rich way that's just delicious simply yep amazing amazing i, I think you've summed up you summed up what a lot of whiskey makers are looking for but i think it very quintessentially feels at home with the distillery like Ben Rick or Glenn Glass. Of course, Ben Dronick is so unchanged by the times that it uh, it just remains a constant, regardless of what the rest of the whiskey industry seems yeah. to do. Um, <laughs> That's I, an interesting I have, one. <laughs> oh well, I mean, <laughs> we have Glenn Dronick has it's set, like, yeah, it's very robust, but it yeah. also has this flair. So the fact that we have the dark fruit as well, we're not just like sliced bread. We have. Yeah a very expressive spirit cup with Glendronic and its saxophone shaped styles. So what this means is that expressive character, of course, can be expressed with flair in different ways. And we do use port cast as well, um, weave them into our PX and other also. And um, yeah, watch the space. Very exciting, very exciting. And it, it's wonderful that you've led me there with a watch this space 
because Miles, I'm going to ask you this question first, but I would love to hear from all of you. Uh, I've got a wonderful question here from Anthony McGowan, who asks questions at every virtual tasting. So for a 10th birthday, thank you for joining this one as well. Uh, Miles, what do you think is ahead for the future of whiskey? Wow, in general. Yeah. Um, okay. Question. Sure. Well, look, I'm, you know, I can, I can answer from, yeah, I mean, the perspective of what, what's happening here in the States, right? And just, just, okay, so, yeah, we're celebrating our 20th year, right? When we applied for our distilling license, there was less than 40 distilleries in the entire U.S., okay? Yeah, we had prohibition. It, it devastated the industry. It took a long time for things to kind of get back up. But so now... Um, about 20 years later, we have over 3,000 distilleries in the U.S. from under 40, right? So, and I mean, you know, to me, I'm, I'm seeing wonderful distilleries pop up all over the world. And even, you know, Ireland with this, to me, this distilling renaissance that's happening there and this kind of return to old, old uh, methods. Um, I, I think the future of whiskey is just more voices, right more more perspectives more you know the more people that get involved the um the more we can see from different perspectives different angles yeah um i think that uh we can sometimes get locked into traditions um that you know maybe maybe eventually don't don't serve us as well right uh, and that innovation to me really is the future because innovation uh, becomes tradition eventually, right? Every tradition that we have in whiskey was innovative at some point, right? It was something that someone thought to do and they did it and they got a great result from it, right? And so it's these innovations that I think push things forward and actually keep it interesting and, and, and keep it fascinating and really kind of push everyone to, uh, to continue to, yeah, try new things to, um, as, as Rachel said, climb that mountaintop, right? And then look for the next one, yeah? Um, I, I think the future of whiskey is, uh, gosh, it's in it's in in so many people's hands, and that's actually really exciting. I think that's great. I think it's it's wonderful that we're seeing single malt being made in as many places as it is these days, um, and to see what people are doing with that. Right? I mean, you look at where we are in the U.S. As I said, we were one of the first to start making single malt. There's over 200 single malt makers now in the U.S. Right? And I mean, what a, what a massive country we have. Yeah. I mean, people ask me all the time about, you know, regional styles and, you know, I, I, I think we are starting to see some of that pop up, but just with the absolute size of this country. Right. So let's say like Portland in the Northwest here is Ireland, right. Uh, Virginia distilling, another excellent single malt maker um, actually worked with Dr. Jim Swan as well at the beginning of their, um, uh, distilling foray but you know if you were to kind of transpose a map of the u.s right over europe and say portland was yeah ireland uh, virginia would be like turkey right um just like the, the vast range of of land and climates um i think is just gonna show yeah show people turn more towards uh what's at hand what can they use that's that's around them rather than yeah i'm going to try to kind of replicate something or or i think it should be done this way because it was by someone else but i think it's going to encourage a lot more um experimentation in that way i think just more delicious flavors which is really what it's all about that's incredible that's incredible i think you've really natively fit as a pioneer of the american whiskey scene and certainly been appreciated here at the club, I think there's a reason that the members uh, resonate with your whiskey making philosophy. And um, yeah, it, it gives me a really organic opportunity to ask you, Bill. I mean, you've been the face of Australian whiskey for so many years, and I'm sure you continue to be. What do you see as the future of Australian and the Australian distilling industry? Yeah, uh, um, so we've been going 32 years, and we were the first in, of the modern era of um, distillation in Australia, craft single malt whiskey distillation. And there are now, what are they saying, three, four, five hundred distilleries, um, not all of those making whiskey. But um, I know some people are concerned about the future. And I used to get asked a lot, um, so Bill, when do you think we'll have too many distilleries? I think we've got something like a hundred here in Tasmania. But a lot of those are very small um, and uh, quite exciting in their own right. And we've now got some larger distilleries, nothing like Scotland yet, but um, still significant distilleries. I know some of the smaller distilleries are worried about the growth of some of the bigger ones. 
I actually see us coming into a very exciting time here in Australia where the bigger distilleries have now finally got enough whisky that we can start taking it to the world. We know the world wants our whisky. We've been asked for it for years and years, but have simply never had enough. And now these bigger distilleries will be able to do that. And when people discover Tasmanian whisky or Australian whisky, they'll come out here to see what's going on because they've been introduced to it through these bigger distilleries. But when they get here, they're going to look for the little small hidden away craft distilleries, the little gems of distilleries. Uh, I know um, Tourism Australia a number of years ago worked out that most people travel in the world um, for an experience in food and beverage. Sure, when we go to Paris, people will say, what did you see? And you'll say the Eiffel Tower. But what they're more interested in is to hear about the wonderful little cafe you discovered in the Marais or this great little winery or this wonderful little distillery. And I see us coming into a period where that will happen for us here in Australia. Um, and I think you're right. You're very right, Miles. The, I think the future for single malt whisky into the future is through innovation. It, um, you know, I, I know it, uh, I, I started making it because I wanted to make a traditional single malt whisky the way the Scots did. I just wanted it to be. Tasmanian, we now have a wonderful distiller that's been with us at Lark for about 16, 17 years, Chris Thompson. And and he's the epitome of um, inventiveness and innovation. And uh, I remember when he released his Canotto cask whiskey, I thought, he's finally gone mad. This is one step too far. <laughs> and as I'm sort of shaking my head thinking, what the bloody hell have you done, Chris? Everybody around me is going, wow, this is great. I love this. And it became one of our most popular selling whiskies. And I thought, well, okay, in Australia, you know that, uh, Seamus, we're, we're, we are a bit rebellious. We're, we're born from a uh, convict era. And um, I think we're allowed to be a little bit naughty. And, uh, um, and I, I, as long as we can still respect um, tradition, and uh, I'm going to take this time to acknowledge uh, the wonderful support and help I've had from Scotland from day one, and I really treasure and value what they do, and I love it to bits, and I love my, I've, I've got too much whiskey at home, and I just, I, I, I love what they do, but I think um, the future for, for us, certainly here in Australia, is exciting, like for you, Miles, over in America, I think you've got some exciting times ahead of you as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, here, here indeed, and that, that's beautifully put, Bill, I, I think it, it, only suits us now and Rachel you sit as one of the leaders and pioneers of the scotch industry um and you steward three incredibly different distilleries as well it'd be wow. incredible to hear your oh. point of view on, on what's ahead for scotch perhaps the hardest well, question. yeah absolutely well considering scotch has been around for centuries and stood the test of time um you know we make what i would argue of course um, are the most characterful single malts in the world. You don't get the diversity of style and individuality of character in a very small part of the world um, as you can find in Scotland. I think there's, you know, you could debate it, but I think most people would agree. Um, and in addition to that, you know, um, <laughs> we're getting more rain of anything with climate, if there is such thing as climate change, it's debatable, but um, we're getting more rain, so that's going to be good for the whiskey. Um, I've got a terrible summer at the moment, but um, yeah, we've got lots of rain. And also <laughs> our climate means that we can produce whiskey to sell from anywhere from a non-age, be it five, six, seven years old, up to 12, up to 15, 18, 20, and as I mentioned, those 60-year-old single malts. So that entirety and richness and depth of portfolio, that is did the test of time and will continue to stand the test of time. And I think, you know, um, that's obviously 100% due to where we are, the richness, the quality of the barley, the quality of the water, the climate, etc. So... I think we've got a bit of an advantage there in terms of creating a very diverse portfolio. Um, also think, you know, we've never known as much. You know, I started in Scotch Whiskey Research in 1991. And, you know, what we, we know today, there's still a lot more to discover. But, you know, we're really tuned in um, in how to make 
the best quality whiskey. So uh, as uh, Miles um, mentioned, I'll mention again, uh, it, you know, we want to reach the ultimate. And of course, it never quite reached the ultimate. So for Glendrona, been around for nearly 200 years, want to raise expectations of what makes the very best single malt from non-age right up to 60 years old. And every touch point is just going to be such a richly rewarding journey. We're at the cusp of some uh, exciting news coming up next week. Um, and then in the next months to come, it's just going to, we're going to be on a roll <laughs> with our Highland spirit, taking it to the world with Spanish flair. It's going to be a revelation in flavour. So we're really at the start. Glendrona, as much as we talk about, it's been around for a long time. It's not been a huge brand. So if you can imagine, we've got a lot of growing to do. We're expanding the distillery. There's a lot of investment. Then millions upon millions on wood. Cherry casks are the most expensive in the industry, as I'm sure you'll all know. Um, so the future is bright. I think also with Ben Reik, um, for me, it's about bringing in newer consumers. It's about surprising and delighting. It's about flavor exploration, more liquor on lips, you know, um, discovering the world of flavor, um, doing exciting things. That's the one I'm going to be experimenting with. So, you know, that's really going to um, resonate, I think, with, you know, new emerging consumers, um, you know, a real cascade, a kaleidoscope of flavor, I think. You know, younger people coming into whiskey are, are, you know, are ready to be surprised and delighted. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think for me, it's all about character at the end of the day. If you put if you have character for whiskey, there's going to be a market for it. So, um, you know, I think for me, it's maintaining and growing and enriching the character of our malts um, to um, discover a whole new world of consumers out there. Um, delight the fans, of course, of Whiskey Club. Absolutely, I can see it growing. It's the biggest club in the world. It's amazing. You've got great fanship, um, you know, the people who are members. And, you know, for me, this is going to be a testing ground as well. So I'm going to be working. I'm already working on some exciting things for the Whiskey Club <laughs> going into the future. And, you know, that's going to be a, a real, some real flavour um, revelations. Um, so um, I think that's pretty much um, summed up. I, I think, you know, we're, we're all, it's all about the endeavour, bringing to new consumers and raising expectations for perhaps what have been our more traditional malts, but bringing them into the new world of, of malt whiskey as well. That, that's beautifully put, Rachel. And um, I think it really summarises why, um, why the whiskey club has grown because it's because of whiskey makers like the three of you, uh, not exclusive to the three of you. I think the three of you really represent all of our best partners in the industry. And it just so happens that, uh, you know, you, you three are fantastic faces for the innovation of all branches of whiskey and the, uh, the commitment to quality that uh, really has seen whiskey grow so wonderfully over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and has seen the club grow in partnership. I uh, I have an opportunity. I'm going to rapid fire a few questions. We're going to do quick answers only because there's a few classics that, of course, the members are asking that I have to throw out. And the classic and Rachel, I'm going to start with you. Miles, you'll go second. Bill, you'll go third. Uh, we're going to go one. Can you tease anything that's coming up for perhaps the Whiskey Club members? Any little hints you can drop? Ooh, something eclectic, <laughs> delicious, <laughs> delicious. Not a distillery we've done for a few years with the Whiskey Club, so something to surprise and delight. Is that Fantastic. enough? That, that was perfect. <laughs> and you caught me thinking about maybe after be, that as well. Oh, <laughs> it will be bottling in uh, September. So Ooh, right, right at the end of it. Well, obviously, it's, it takes a while to get to you. I know around the other side of the globe, but yeah, yeah our batting will be uh, coming up in the next couple of months. That's that's very very exciting, Miles. Anything to tease? Of course, tease. we've just pioneered the Syrah casks. 
but the members already want to know what's next. Always, always what's next. Um, yeah, I know, right? We're done with the trilogy. I don't know if you saw, uh, Sona actually called it a triptych, which I thought was great in her write-up of it. The Spirited Woman, if everyone follows her. Um, teaser for the club. Yeah, look, I mean, this this last major release, the, the Musket, you know, where we partnered with you in the creation of it and then partnered with Sten and Colleen, right? An Australian winemaker, legendary. Um, we're taking that a step further. Um, we're, we're getting even more involved with uh, some, some makers there. And um, yeah, just, just diving deeper into this partnership. I mean, it's, I, th I think really just <sighs> personifies the growth, the kind of symbiotic growth of the Whiskey Club Australia and of Westward Whiskey World, you know, for us worldwide even, to have the two of us grow together and continue this partnership. So uh, for us, we're just going to go deeper on that partnership. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know, yeah, if I'll say any more than that. But yeah. Uh, I I think you'd be giving it away if you said uh, much more than that, but it's uh, it's incredibly exciting. And Bill, I don't know if Chris has shared too many samples with you just yet, but um, if you can tease the members at all. <laughs> no, well, that's really Chris's domain, and he's he's the the, the expert of uh, what he does for luck. But but I do know that we're coming into an era now where for a long time we've been mainly quarter casks. Um, and our whiskey is is just right at a certain age, but we're now getting to an exciting time where we've got some uh, bigger barrels, some very old um, Sepples field casks that are starting to come online. And I know Chris is very excited about coming into the future. We're going to see some pretty special limited releases, um, and he's really working on the peated whiskey too. Oh, yeah. So I've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> and we've come out with a lightly peated whiskey, which is everybody's wrapped in. But I know coming into the future, there's going to be something a little bit more exciting with peat yeah. coming out of an older cask. It is pretty incredible spirit. Um, and, yeah, I, you've done a wonderful job of walking the tightrope there, Bill. <laughs> uh, the, the next question, and again, rapid fire, it's from Damien Cox. Uh, Rachel, to you first, then to Miles, then to Bill. Uh, we're asking, what was the first dram that you remember trying that really hooked you into whiskey? Oh, God, that's so difficult. Um, I can't just say one because it's, it's there's not just one. Um, I mean, I started my apprenticeship kind of with Glenmorne, do you have to say, <laughs> and our beg. So they were kind of at the start of my journey as well as all the different um other malts and then of course leaving the best to last with Glendronic, Glen Glasser and then <laughs> of course. But yeah, I think that pulls apart style from light to like monster. Um kind of, you know, uh, awaken my senses to um the kind of uh, range of flavors you could get um from one extreme to the next. And then over time of course I've um, managed to get to very, very complex, balanced, <laughs> rich whiskies I'm working with today. Absolutely. Wonderful. And, and Miles, same question to you. If there was any dram that really hooked you when you were still a brewer and made you think, you know, I'm going to make whiskey like this one day. It was even before brewing. I actually became a brewer because I wanted to make whiskey because of, yeah, some whiskies that I tried. I ended up in my sort of early 20s managing a whiskey bar in Kansas City and, you know, realized at that point that I'd been, you know, drinking whiskey and enjoying it, but maybe not knowing it and appreciating it. And it was a, it was a Glenn Farkless 18 that uh, changed everything. It really was. And that's what's kind of set me on this path. Right. Because then that brought me to brewing school, which brought me to making whiskey. So, yeah. Wow. Well, Bill, I fear your question, your answer to that question might be similar. But... <laughs> well, it is similar, but I will mention two whiskeys because the whole idea of, um, you know, wanting to make whiskey came from that fishing trip with my father-in-law asking that question, why isn't somebody making whiskey? And we did that while we were drinking uh, Glenfiddich whiskey. I mean, going back 35 years ago, pretty much that was not all you could get. There was an odd bottle of single malt about, but Glenfiddich certainly led the way. Um, but then when Lynn and I said, okay, let's not talk about it. Let's actually get a license and do something about it. We toasted that, with a 15-year-old Glenn Farkless. And I remember holding that up and saying to Lynn, gee, if we could make a whiskey like this one day, I'd be mm. pretty happy. And uh, that's the whiskey, I guess, that 
we sort of held in front of us as our torch for this is what we want to do. That's incredible. That's incredible. I think it's wonderful to see the, the diverse kind of uh, inspirations that all of you have. Listen, I'm only going to ask one more question, uh, and it, it's a wonderful one. It's uh, it's from Carl Angler, and uh, he's he's asking, and again, Rachel, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, out of all the things each of you have contributed to the world of whiskey, what is the one thing that you yourself are most proud to bring to it? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's about bringing character. Um, Scotch whiskey, you could say, is incredible richness of character and its diversity of style. And I think everything I do, um, every distillery I've worked with and worked with today is to bring out that character and that richness, to celebrate it, to um, bring it to the world, to um, to really make it shine. So especially now and next week <laughs> with new news and looking into the future, um, you know, hopefully you'll see kind of elements of my nature and character of where I'm kind of shaping things, influencing things um, across the team to really um, celebrate the unique, distinctive um, personalities and the kind of the, the very, very best of every distillery I work with. Um, so hopefully you you kind of see that in the next few years as more expressions are released um, to the world and um, yeah, they, they grab attention and they will obviously be enjoyed by many people around the world. So for me, I think it is character. That's uh, that's very exciting. And while you were saying that, I finally clocked what you are going to be announcing in a, a week or two. And oh my <laughs> God, that's so exciting! Whiskey, whiskey club members, take note. You're getting a heck of a teaser. This is this is huge. Yeah, and it's what's <laughs> going to come, and it's what's going to come. It really is the very start. Even though we've been around for two hundred years, nearly the very start of a very very richly rewarding journey in the story of the Glendronic. So, you know, I'm just, I mean, obviously for me, having been born beside the distillery and brought up, you know, to see the roots, the substance, the, oh, just everything, the legacy with flair brought to life and but still being that robust Highland spirit, you know, it's my home, you know? Oh, so, yeah. Goodness me, Rachel, that, that's beautifully put. Miles, I'll ask the same question of you um, bringing plenty to the uh, world of American whiskey uh, and all the places you've toured. What's the one thing yourself that you are so proud of to have brought? Well, that's actually uh, what, what Rachel ended with is where I was going to go with it is is bringing, bringing the Pacific Northwest to the world, you know. Um, Westwood's been around for, yeah, 20 years. I've been there for almost 12, right? I've been there for over half the distillery's existence. Um, the first time Westwood was released was just the year before I started as a single barrel. So it's, it's, it's been something that I've, I've had a hand in actually creating and, and then, you know, pioneering a new category of whiskey from the United States that, yeah, has just given us the opportunity to bring the Pacific Northwest out to the rest of the world through this whiskey. Um, you know, our culture... Um, our ethos, um, yeah, you know, the grain that's grown right here, the the cash from winemakers that are down the road, you know, trading cash with brewers that are just a couple blocks away, taking the idea of who we are and what we're doing in this environment and just just bringing that to everyone. Um, and yet, yeah, same as Rachel. I mean, my, my mother's side of the family is, is from Oregon. And uh, so, I mean, this is home. And I'm just super proud to, like, bring this out to the world. Yeah, that's that's definitely where it's at. It's, uh, it's beautifully put. And uh, I'm excited to ask this question of you, Bill, because you've literally started a uh, whiskey industry. Uh, there's probably many things that you could pick, but I uh, would love to hear what is the one thing that you are most proud of having brought to the whiskey industry? There is many things, but because those words of John Grant were ringing in my ear, uh, I, I asked him at the time, um, you know, why he would be so generous as to help me. And um, he said, well, Bill, if somebody comes to your distillery and it's their first experience with whiskey, I'd like it to be a good experience. So then initially we were on our own and I just thought, you know, if other people want to make whiskey and I could do what John did and encourage them and help them to make good whiskey, who knows, one day, maybe in Australia, we'll have 
an industry that is recognised around the world. And I think the one thing that Lynn and I are both very proud of that we've tried to foster and it has worked is a sense of collegiality amongst all of the people in our industry. When people came to me and said, Bill, would you help me start making whiskey like I, John Grant did for me? I said, sure, please let me help you. And I'm not going to ask anything other than if somebody comes to you with the same question, would you please help them? And I'd like to think we are known for that. And, and in that respect, I see sort of Lark um, has a, a, an obligation, I suppose, as a leader of the industry to foster and encourage that. And uh, I'm certainly very proud of the fact that we have been a leader in that respect. And uh, if that's the one legacy we can leave, Seamus, I'm going to be a very proud man. Beautifully put, Bill. And I think it summarises the feeling around uh, around this virtual roundtable as well. Um even to have three incredible whiskey makers around a table, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we're very lucky to be able to do. And speaking from the Whiskey Club, I mean, we're 10 years in and we couldn't be prouder to be putting some of the world's best scotches up against an Australian whiskey that people need to find out about, up against mm. an American whiskey mm. that maybe someone is absolutely in love with but their friend hasn't heard of yet. And... Uh, and on the Scotch side, bringing the next level of that incredible Scotch whiskey. So, look, uh, from from the uh, the deepest sense of appreciation for me and the entire Whiskey Club family, I want to say a massive thank you to the three of you for uh, hopping on tonight and uh, talking about your incredible distilleries. It's wonderful to hear it from your own mouths. Well, Solange. Thank you. Thank you, Whiskey Club. We love you. Thank Happy you, Whiskey Club. <laughs> and, yeah, congratulations on 10 years. Amazing. No, no, th thank you very much, guys. But um, look, while we couldn't do it without you and uh, we couldn't do it without every whiskey maker that you represent as well, we certainly couldn't do this without the members. So uh, I would like to raise a toast and say goodbye with a massive cheers to uh, every member who's watching along right now and every member who isn't because uh, 10 years is a lot of whiskey drunk and we couldn't do it without them. So yeah, cheers. Cheers. Happy 10th anniversary. Cheers to you all.